that Molly has said about me. But the one thing she didn't say is that I'm a really avid boater. And although I had to sell my boat a little while ago, uh, I've cruised the San Juan Islands for 20 years and therefore been in uh, to Fisherman's Bay any number of times. Every time the 4th of July comes around, I remember those days when there are a bunch of boats that anchor in Fisherman's Bay and we were watching the fireworks there, which has been really great. Also been to Spencer Spit a number of times with the boat, uh, also kayaked out of there. So I feel like uh, I've got a relationship with Lopez that spans all of the wonderful years that I've been here uh, in Bellingham and around the San Juan Islands. So it's always a pleasure to speak with folks who live in a place that while many of us don't know, I do know and I know how wonderful it is uh, to be there. I really appreciate also the introduction that Malia gave. She's right, this was a presentation that we planned both before the pandemic and before the real uprise, outcry and protest around racial justice and inequity that are taking place right now, both across the country and around the world. I would love to, at some point, be able to sit down and to have a discussion about current events with you. However, one of the things I know about helping people have discussions around difficult issues like race in this country is that many of us don't have those tools. We don't grow up in a culture that teaches us how to have difficult conversations around important topics. And that's really what this presentation is about. It's not so much about what's going on in the world right now. It's more about how do we talk about what's going on in the world right now? How do we engage with each other? How do we engage with our families, our children, even strangers? How do we have a difficult conversation around an important topic like race? So let me go to my screen and I'm going to share my PowerPoint. This might just take just a minute for all of that to, um, to get set up with Zoom. And Malia, would you raise your hand when you can see my power? Great. So I'm assuming that if Malia can see it, everybody else can. And also, if I haven't already, I do want to thank Humanities Washington for this opportunity. It's because of Humanities Washington that I've been able to go around the state now for the last two years um, presenting this presentation. So I really want to share with you what I think are the important ideas around how you have a difficult conversation around an important topic like race. And so our goals this afternoon are very simple. First, I want to briefly discuss why it is I think uh, we want to have this conversation. Most importantly, I would like to share with you some tools that I think might be profitable for all of us as we engage in this conversation. And then three, I really want to challenge you with the help of this wonderful technology to actually have that conversation when we get to that point, Malia has already helped to set up breakout rooms where you'll be given the opportunity to be in a breakout room with another person and then to use the tools that we've spoken about in order to have a conversation. So that's what we would like to do this afternoon. Why have a conversation about race? Well. You know, you have to look at these PowerPoint slides as though they were written pre-pandemic and in some ways uh, pre uh, all of the current things that are going on, particularly before the tragic 
killing of George Floyd. I don't think I have to say that now, as I often did, that it's an unresolved issue that won't disappear by itself. The events of the last several months have really made that clear. And as somebody who's been involved in this kind of discussion at many different levels, teaching the introduction to the African-American experience at Western Washington University almost 30 years ago, um, authoring several books on this issue, even taking one of those books on the Oprah show, I can tell you that certainly in my lifetime, having an honest, discussion about race in this country and then doing something from that discussion that really makes a difference, that's tough. Race is an unresolved issue. It has been an unresolved issue for this country for many years. And until and unless we're ready to bring about change by first engaging in a conversation, that issue will continue to remain unresolved. Again, I, I don't think I have to tell you, simply point to the news and say that if we don't have a conversation about it, if we don't talk about it, there's a really good chance that we'll end up fighting about it. We only need to look then at you know, what happened in Charlottesville uh, several years ago, but even more importantly, what's been going on right now in the last several months. I don't know other than talking any other way to bridge differences. Now, ordinarily, if I was with, uh, with you live, I would take the time to go around the room and point to people who were raising their hands what their thoughts were about why to have a conversation about race. But we can't do that. We can, however, try this uh, if you're on Zoom, I think you'll see on the right side of your screen, there's a place where you can actually click a button that says raise your hand. And if we can make that happen, I might take two or three comments that are your thoughts about why to have a conversation about race. And if for any reason you can't get to that screen, I think you have to bring up uh, open a screen in order to click on that green button. But if you can't do that, we'll wait just a moment or two and then we'll move on. But if there's anybody who does want to raise their hand and say why you feel we need to have a conversation about race, please do that now. Okay, well, that's fine. And again, it may just be, oops, going a little fast there. There we go. So the next thing I wanted to say is, you know, one of the things we are really, really good at, I see, um, Michelle, you've raised your hand. Uh, let's, let me go through this set of questions and then Michelle, uh, we'll get back to you and give you an opportunity to say something. So. We're really good at not having conversations that we might need to. You know, here I'm thinking about a famous uh, quote that uh, is attributed to a number of people. I've heard it attributed to um, uh, Oscar Wilde. I'm not sure if it was him or someone else. I've also heard it attributed to a Nobel laureate in economics who said, when faced with the need to change, or the ability to prove that change isn't necessary, most people get busy on the proof. And I kind of adapt that to difficult conversations. When faced with the need to have a difficult conversation or the ability to prove that maybe you don't have to have that conversation, a lot of people get busy on the proof. I know that's true because as a psychotherapist, I've sat across from a lot of couples who probably need to have really difficult conversations, but also find it really difficult 
to have those conversations. So why do we sometimes avoid a conversation about race? One of the things I've heard a lot is that people will say, I'm afraid of revealing my true feelings if I have that conversation. If I let you know what I feel, my God, I might be in too vulnerable position by revealing what my true feelings are. I've also heard people say to me, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not sure I wanna have a conversation uh, that I'm afraid people won't understand me. And then a common thing I've heard a lot is people say, well, God, if I tell you what I really feel, then people are gonna call me a blank, you fill that in. People are gonna call me a bigot or prejudiced or racist or anti-racist or you name it. All the terms we throw around uh, that we hear about uh, in the news a lot. So again, I think I'm gonna ask, uh, you know, if you have some thoughts, uh, raise your hand. Uh, Molly, it's not clear to me right now how I acknowledge who it is that is raising their hand. Can you break in and do that? Well, as people can find how to raise their hand by clicking on the participants button, and then it'll show up at the top of the participant. So right now, Michelle and Brenda have both raised their hand. Great, and how do we acknowledge them so that we can actually let them say something? Well, if you say their name, I can unmute them for you. Great, so I saw Michelle first. Let's okay. unmute Michelle and ask her to say and share with us. There we go. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Oh, fantastic. Um, so I can't quite remember how you worded the prompt for us to share. It, um, it was, why have a conversation about race? Oh, fantastic, yes. So in, in my family, uh, race is a very active topic. It's something we talk about literally every day. We are an a interracial family. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm losing the train of my, my thought that I wanted to share. Oh, and, and what I have experienced over the many decades is, and, and I'm, I'm a white person, when I try to talk about uh, race around uh, with other white people, invariably they get very uncomfortable, whether they know my background or not. It's not something white people want to talk about. And then I get very uncomfortable because I love talking about it. I, and, <laughs> and it's the culture of my family to talk about it. And, and I just you know, I, I wonder about that discomfort area. Now, over the years, I've kind of quit caring about the comfort of others when it comes to talking about race. We just have to talk about it. So I'm just, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't really have a question around that. I just, it's, that's been my starting point is just um, trying to engage other white people in conversations around race. And it's very hard. So first of all, I wanna say thank you, Michelle, for sharing that. And one of the things I heard is actually an answer to both this slide and the previous slide. I heard you use the word uncomfortability several times. And so what I might suggest, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle, is that one reason to have the con a conversation about race is maybe to get beyond that uncomfortability. And one reason to avoid having a conversation about race is because it makes people uncomfortable. Did I kind of get you right there based on what you were saying? Right, there's a paradox there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and um, Malia, uh, let's see, I can't see any who else is on the, um, uh, has raised their hands. So, okay. okay, so, um, well, Brenda was next. Please, let's do that. Okay, Brenda, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm, I'm going to offer maybe another paradox. I, I see conversation and discussion as a bridge. At the same time, anytime people are allowed to bring their voices to the table, 
it increases equality. So first, I hear you saying, first of all, thank you. And the first thing I heard you say was that it acts as a bridge. And therefore, one of the reasons to have a conversation about race is to create bridges that are necessary. Yeah. Um, the second thing I heard you say is that by having more voices at the table, it creates a certain level of equity or equality. And that's important as well, too. Did I get you right? Yes, In sir. The way I heard you? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Molly, let, let's go on to the next person. OK, we have um, three more people have their hands raised. And Karen is next. And I will unmute you, Karen, if I can. It's not letting me, Karen, so you should unmute yourself. OK. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yes. Thank you, Karen. Great. Um, I was thinking about um, this because I have uh, been bringing up the topic among family and friends lately. And so, and the reasons I am doing that, one is that I'm one of those people that when I talk about things, it helps me sort out my own feelings. And I as I've been reading and listening to podcasts and watching painful uh, videos, including George Floyd, um, it's called up a lot of feelings for me. And so, <coughs> excuse me, um, just being able to talk about it helps me sort out my feelings and hearing the perspective of others um, helps me uh, as well. And then the second reason is because it is uh, so such a long neglected uh, topic among white people. Um, and like most other white people living in a white bubble, um, I had no idea the, the severity and extent of racism in our culture for the last 400 years. I am learning a lot and it is blowing my mind. And I think it's really important that more of us understand what's really at stake and what's really been happening. And so the, the acute importance of this um, is the second reason. So both of those um, are my reasons for wanting to talk about racism. The third uh, uh, reason is that um, if I'm talking like in a, our uh, Quaker group has a, a anti-racism study group going on right now and, and it helps me as I'm learning, um, it helps inform my thoughts and feelings. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And let me make sure I heard you clearly. Um, the first thing you said is that having a conversation about race helped you sort out your own feelings. And that was one very important statement that you shared. And the second thing you said was that it's really important because it's been so long neglected and that as you are having these conversations, you are also learning some things about history, about yourself and others about this country that are really important as well too. So the two things that I heard clearly from you was one, sorting out your feelings and learning. Did I get you right there, Karen? Um, the only other uh, thing that, I, uh, that is important to me um, is that that we do share knowledge and perspective. Um, as I brought this up in a, among family and friends out on our deck the other day, I felt like it, I'm learning things and not everyone else is necessarily reading or, or studying this and I wanna share it. Uh, I wanna share it because I think that we all need to understand it better because we can't do anything about it unless a lot of us understand it better. 
So then I hear really three things. One is having a conversation because it helps you sort out your feelings, having the conversation because it's a long neglected issue and it's very important, and having the conversation because once you understand, you need to share, which means you need to have the conversation. Did I get you right there? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Malia, I think we're going to move on. And those of you who still have your hands up, it's great that you don't physically have to actually have your hand up. Um, we'll have another opportunity as we uh, move through this for you to share any thoughts and feelings that you have. Thank you, for all of you who did share in that way. So what goes into having a conversation about race? You know, the funny thing is, it's not that hard to talk about the tools. It's a lot harder to actually put them in play. Why is it hard to put them in place or in play? I think it's because we grow up learning not to have conversations. We learn to have debates. You look at TV and you've got one talking head talking to another talking head. And I sometimes listen to CNN and I say, that's not a conversation. That's just people yelling at each other. And yelling at each other doesn't pass for having the kind of meaningful conversations that might bring about change. And I just ask you to think about the relationships you are in or have had, and I'm sure you know the difference between having a meaningful conversation with a partner that may bring about change or simply yelling at each other. And I think you know where those two generally tend to get. The yelling at each other often doesn't go very far. And if you've had the opportunity to have a meaningful conversation in a relationship that brings about change, you'll know that not only does that or can that bring you closer, but it actually can change the relationship in a really positive way. I think that's not only true about conversations between two people about their relationship. I think it's important and true in public discourse and conversations around these really important issues like race. So let's look at what goes into this. You know, a lot of times you will see me driving down the road, if you're in my car, yelling at my radio. And I don't care if it's NPR, certainly if it's not NPR, another station. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm saying people are throwing around terms without any understanding of what those terms mean. Now, if you take nothing from this afternoon's presentation, then this slide, and by the way, I'm going to make these slides available to Malia, who can then also make them available to you. So no need to take notes if you are. But if you take nothing away other than this slide, I think it will be a lot. We hear a lot of talk about He's a racist, he's an anti-racist, um, you know, without really having a grip on what that definition means. Back in 1970, Lyndon Baines Johnson created the Kerner Commission in order to try to get a handle on what had gone on in the summers of 1968 and 1969 in large urban areas like New York, Chicago, Detroit, and Los Angeles, particularly in communities of color, which led to the kinds of rebellions that you're seeing today. And that commission met, produced a very large report, some 500 pages, about the issues that gave rise to those rebellions. And one of the most important things that came from that Kerner Commission report I think, was that they said, if we're going to talk about race and racism, we had better have a good definition 
of what we mean by racism. And what the Kerner Commission said was this, look, anybody can be prejudiced. Prejudice, prejudice just means you form an opinion in the absence of complete information. I might not like you because you're too tall or you're too short or you're blonde haired or you're uh, brunette or you're redhead or you're too fat as far as I'm concerned or all sorts or I don't like your skin color. I mean, I can be prejudiced in that way. But the Kerner Commission said prejudice alone <clears throat> does not equate to racism. When you add power to prejudice, then the Kerner Commission says you have the definition of racism. By power, they meant the power to affect someone's life physically, emotionally, economically, politically, educationally, in terms of health. Prejudice plus power equals racism. So just as an example, if I'm driving down the street and I run through a stop sign and there happens to be a police car at the corner and the police car drives up behind me, flashes his lights and asks me to stop. If that officer is stopping me because I ran through a stop sign, he comes over to the car, sees that I'm African American, asks me to get out and give him my license. He might have prejudice, there's certainly a possibility, he doesn't like people of color. But if all he does is say, look, I'm giving you a ticket for getting through that stop sign, I get back in my car and drive away, obviously having to have to pay that ticket, or at least appear in court, he might still leave with that prejudice, but I also leave with my life. We saw in the case of George Floyd, a situation where maybe, maybe not, the officer had a reason to stop Mr. Floyd, but he didn't have a reason to take his life. Prejudice plus power. You might not like me, but if you use that dislike to affect me in some way, physically, emotionally, economically, educationally, or health-wise, that's what the Kerner Commission said rises to the level of racism. I think that's a really important definition for a couple of reasons. One, it separates out prejudice and power and allows us to have a discussion about each of those separately. Someone, actually more than one person, many people have said to me when they see this slide, wow, you could actually substitute for racism, sexism, um, uh, uh, any type of gender bias, and it would work in the same way. That these various kinds of issues that we're dealing with in our society can be broken down into our prejudice, and our power. And yes, I can be prejudiced, but if I don't allow that prejudice to rise to actually impacting your life in some of the ways that I've indicated, maybe it's not racist, maybe it's not sexist. Prejudice alone is not enough. And I think that's really important in having this discussion and understanding what's going on right now in the world, because what we're seeing and what people are saying is there are instances of prejudice plus power. And it's when that power, whether it's systemic racism, whether it's institutional, uh, based on historical uh, understandings, that it's adding prejudice and power that really adds up to the challenges that we're faced with. So I think this is a great place to start with a definition in terms of having this discussion that yes, I can be prejudiced, the prejudice alone is not the same as racism. Prejudice plus power is. And I also want to say here that at least in one presentation I gave, uh, a woman raised her hand and said, you know, um, I have a little problem with this definition because for the last 
10 years or so, I've been really working on the issue of personal power. I want to feel that I'm empowered personally as a woman, and somehow that doesn't fit with your equation. And it didn't. And she was absolutely right. This isn't an, when I speak about power here, I'm not talking about how we might say, I feel empowered and I feel strong and I feel good about myself. No, I'm speaking in this case about power over somebody, power to do something to, some, to another human being. That's what we're really talking about in this definition. So I think what I'll do here is once again, just maybe take one or two comments if there are any. And my question to you would be, what's it like to be presented with this definition of racism separating out prejudice and power? So we'll wait a moment to see if anybody wants to raise their hand. Looks like Michael um, has raised his hand. Michael, yes. So Malia, why don't you uh, unmute Michael and Michael, I, thank you very much for electronically raising your hand. I try to follow directions really well. Uh, <laughs> We're all learning how to do that in this day and age. First of all, thanks for that. And um, I think this definition certainly will help me and I happen to look like you uh, in my role as a school board president, as well as working in a school district, because oftentimes with students, whether it be high school, middle school, or elementary, and teachers all, um, how do we really, really keep it simple? And as I said in one of the questions that I submitted to the link, is that we'll be back in school in some form or fashion in September, and after being out of school for six months, basically, there will be tons of discussions that take place in classrooms. So how do you keep it simple and get everybody on the same page with a definition? I think that's nothing but amazing. So I'll just say thanks. That's my comment. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. And I can say, you know, I first came across this definition, well, 30 years ago, and I really appreciate it for many of the reasons that you're saying is it allows us to have a simple way of talking and beginning to talk about these issues. But you know, the truth is you can go deep into the prejudice and power side as far as you want. And I think that's all so important too. So I'm going to move on and say, you know, the next tool in learning how to have a discussion about a difficult issue is what I call active listening. Now, my background is in psychotherapy, as you may have heard Molly say at the beginning. Um, I'm a psychotherapist and chiropractor by training, did my postdoc in psychotherapy at the New York Psychosynthesis Institute. So I've spent many, many hours across the table from individuals, couples, groups, families, trying to sort out the issues between them. And one of the things I've learned, one of the things you learn as a student in psychotherapy is how you have and facilitate discussions that allow people to talk about difficult issues. And here's what I know. I know that if you're going to have a meaningful conversation about a difficult issue, then you who are listening need to listen without talking. Easy said, hard to do. Most of us are trained to listen this way. Well, she's saying that, um, but well, I gotta remember, I can say this. And boy, I'm glad she didn't say that because I can jump in there when, uh, and say, say this. In fact, I'm not even gonna wait for her to finish. I'm gonna jump in right now. You know, we have these kinds of talking head discussions, which are more appropriate to debates than they are meaningful communication. The ability to listen while someone else is talking can be a real challenge to actually do, but it is a really important first step in allowing a person to say what they're feeling and more importantly, to allow you to hear that. So listening without talking. 
repeating without editing. Now, I'm not always good at this, although I try to be, and I hope maybe you heard in the few questions that I listened and responded to, one way of doing that. With each person, what I tried to do was to say to them to repeat back, not in their words verbatim, but as I heard those words, what I thought I heard them say. And I also asked them to correct me or add to whatever they said. So I was really clear that I did hear them. So the ability to ask somebody, or let me say it this way, the ability to repeat what you've just heard without editing it to the point that it's not what that person said. So you're listening and you're, then you're saying back to that person, did I hear you right? Is this what you said? And then that gives the person the opportunity as several people did. Well, I, I, I wanna add this or I really meant that. And that's really critical both for you to hear, but also for whomever is talking to, be, to feel like they've been heard. Now the third piece here, and really there's only these three simple things for active listening, is respecting the person who's talking without judging them. Boy, this is a real challenge. It's as though if I listen to what you say, I have to agree with you. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. I can listen to what you say without agreeing with you at all, but I can still listen to you. And I know from having worked for years with people in crisis, with people who need to change their behaviors or their relationship um, interactions, that the way you get people to change is not by yelling at them, but it's by respecting who they are without judging them for where they are. So again, as I ask you in a moment to engage with another person in having this kind of discussion, I think you want to keep in the back of your mind that you can listen to what another person says without necessarily believing it or wanting to adopt that as your own belief. But that doesn't invalidate what they're saying. It simply means you disagree and you will get a chance to say what you're feeling or believing as well. So it's possible simply to respect somebody without necessarily judging whether what it is they believe is what you believe. You can listen to what somebody says without feeling you need to believe what it is they're actually saying. And that's another really important skill in active listening. So really the last tool in terms of what it takes to have a difficult conversation about an important topic is how do you engage from your heart and not your head? Easily said, um, but not always easily done, we are trained to have conversations from our head. What I think, what do you think, what do you believe? And as this quote from Andrew Bennett says, the longest journey you'll ever take is the eight, 18 inches from your head to your heart. And yet, I also know from working with people for a number of years in terms of helping them figure out how they can change is you change when you allow yourself to feel the need to change. In other words, you change from your feelings, not necessarily from your thoughts. You change from your heart, not necessarily your head. So in practical terms, what that means, when you are listening, you're listening by asking yourself the question, how does this make me feel? Rather than what does this make me think? Remember again, if we're in a debate, one of the things you're trained to do in the debate is as you're listening to that other person speak, you are saying, oh, what do I think about this? What do I think about that? 
What can I save here? What can I say to rebut, rebut them there? That's not how you have an important conversation about a difficult topic. You really want to allow yourself the opportunity to say, how does this other person's words cause me to feel? And similarly, when you get the turn to speak, you want to speak by offering, this is how I feel, rather than this is what I think. Easily said, sometimes a little more challenging because we don't grow up learning how to have conversations from our heart as opposed to our head. So let me just review the, that really quickly. I mean, the first thing is having some definitions about what it is we're having this conversation on race about. And the one basic definition I shared with you is that race equals prejudice plus power. You can be prejudiced. Anybody can for whatever silly or stupid reason. Uh, even sometimes given um, new information, people just don't want to let go of their prejudice. But prejudice alone is not racism. Prejudice plus power is. So have that definition, I think, is a great place to start. Second, how do you actively listen? So in terms of active listening, you want to be able to listen without talking. That is really just be present for that other person. You want to be able to repeat without editing, making sure you heard what another person has said and giving them the opportunity to correct what you may have thought you heard so that they feel heard. And the third thing is to be able to, you know, just to respect or at least feel you can hear a person without feeling you need to accept or believe everything that person says. And then finally, the third tool, the third piece of these tools is <coughs> be able to engage from your heart and not your head. Having said that, I want to challenge you to actually put these tools to some use. And I believe Molly has set this up where you can separate out into breakout sessions, which will essentially be rooms of two people where only you and the other person in that room, and if there's two people on the same uh, video screen, then it might be more than two people, but you'll have two sessions, two pairs with each other. And what I'm gonna ask you in that pairing is that you decide who is going to speak and who is going to listen. And the person speaking then has the opportunity to say what it is they're feeling. The person who's listening has an opportunity to practice some of those skills that we presented. And I'm actually going to ask you to have a conversation around this issue. What's it like to realize that there are demonstrations for and discussions of racial equity across the country and around the world. What's it like to realize what's going on right now as we see these demonstrations and discussions 